Hey everyone, David Rishpan with another lesson video here on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about how to practice, not what to practice, how to practice, how to physically and mentally maximize your practice time. <laughs> video is not going to be genre specific or instrument specific. It is going to deal in general problems. Obviously, I am a piano player and a lot of the examples I will refer back to are piano specific, but you can apply this to whatever your instrument is and whatever the style of music you're working on is. Let's get into it. The first thing I want to talk about is posture and ergonomics, literally how you are set up and how you are playing. There's a common issue I see with a lot of my piano students and it is a lot of what I call the chicken wing. There is a lot of movement in the elbows and the shoulders and extraneous movement that you don't need. A lot of this I have found in a year of teaching over video and watching people on their own individual setups as opposed to teaching in a school where we're all on the same piano or all on the same instrument. People are setting up in the wrong way. Specifically for piano, either the chair is too low or too high, or the piano or keyboard itself is too low or too high. You want to be set up in the optimal position of your instrument for you. Specifically referring to piano, you want to keep your wrists just above your hand. If you just threw your hands out on your lap, that's the kind of angle you want your hands to be at. And then everything else falls in line. The forearm, the elbow, everything else falls in line with that. For me, that is the most comfortable position to be playing piano in, and when I correct my students and get them to play that way, their mobility and their fluidity on the instrument increases by leaps and bounds. So the first thing when you set up your rig, whatever your instrument is, to practice and to perform, make sure it is ergonomically and physically well set up for you. This goes back to pianist Kenny Werner's renowned book Effortless Mastery and he talks a lot about playing effortlessly. Now how I interpret playing effortlessly is not that what we're working on is simple or easy, but it means that we're not carrying stress or tension while we're working on whatever we are working on. I know that I carry my stress, emotional and physical stress. Uh, in my shoulders and my neck. That comes from years of lugging around my gear and just when I tense up emotionally, my shoulders go up, my neck gets tense. That's where I know I bear the load of my stress. And if you lock your shoulders and you lock your neck, if you're trying to play piano for any period of time, you're not going to actually be able to play. So the stress that comes from working on difficult material uh, should not manifest itself physically, and that's what I believe Kenny Werner means by playing effortlessly. When you're practicing, it may not be easy, it may not be simple, but your body is not getting in the way of you being able to do what you want to do. That's what I have taken playing effortlessly to mean. Also, on the topic of posture, if you perform standing up, then you should practice standing up, at least for part of your practice routine. 
the physiology of any instrument while you're seated is very, very different than it is while you're standing up. When I play keyboard standing up, for example, my arms and my wrists are by necessity at a different angle than they are when I'm seated. And if I haven't worked on playing what I need to play standing up, it's gonna be a pretty rude surprise when I get to the gig. When you're practicing, especially over this past year where we're teaching ourselves new things via the amazing amount of content on YouTube and other sites, you need to be able to evaluate yourself in your practice session. And it becomes very easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of information that's out there and the amount of information that you want to assimilate into your own playing. So set yourself some concrete goals goals that are not subjective and that are not even really artistic. They are math, they are objective, they are things you can check off a list. Something like, I want to play the entirety of this piece. I want to play the entirety of this piece at a certain tempo. I want to get this set of exercises up by 20 BPM. I want to do these things that are objective, quantifiable, goals that you can constantly evaluate yourself on. This will allow you to more accurately and efficiently track your progress in your own practice session, especially if you are unable to check in with a teacher or a mentor on a regular basis. Don't panic. Over the past three or four years, I've really noticed a shift in how students respond to making a mistake. If you are practicing, mistakes come with the territory. We practice to get better and we practice to fix mistakes. Do not fix your mistake by a panic response. What happens when you do that is you are putting a whole bunch of noise, a whole bunch of sound into your muscles, into your brain, into your ears, and into the air. And what I notice with students who have done this is that sometimes they get to what the right thing should have been, sometimes they don't, and even when they get to the right thing, they get there a little bit by a fluke. They don't necessarily understand what their mistake was and what they needed to do to fix it because there's all this other extraneous information that they played in between those two things. So what I suggest to all my students and what I suggest to anybody who's watching is to just stop. Stop. When you make a mistake, you stop and you keep your hands where they were so that you can analyze the mistake, analyze what happened, and then consciously fix the mistake so that the next thing that you play is the right piece of information. You have corrected the mistake in a very conscious and effective, efficient way. You haven't arrived at the right answer just by guessing. Another thing I notice is that when a mistake happens, people lose their relationship to the metronome. I primarily work in forms of black American music, which also means that those forms of music happen in relationship to tempo and to groove, consistent tempo and consistent groove. This is one of the biggest hurdles I find for classical pianists coming into jazz or pop music, the way that you practice this type of music has to be locked to the metronome. And so what I notice when people start to panic and try to fix their mistakes by panic response is that they start to ignore the metronome 
And if they're practicing with a metronome with an accent on it, whether it's on two and four, or whether it's all four beats with an accent on beat one, however they've got their metronome set up, if you don't stop and you don't wait for the metronome to cycle around, then you are practicing without your primary reference of time. If you are practicing rhythmic music, groove music, and you are not with your metronome, however long you have spent playing off of the metronome is time wasted in your practice routine. So when you make a mistake, stop, look at your hands, figure it out, and then make sure the next thing you play is the right thing and that you start again in time, at the top of the phrase, at the top of the idea, at the top of the piece, in time. Practice performance. I always encourage my students to practice performance. If you are going to be a performer, whether it's for an audition, for a gig, for a live stream, if you have to play a continuous set of music without stopping, then you need to practice not stopping. And we need to build our muscles and our reflexes and our instincts to be able to react in real time in the most musical way possible to things that will go wrong. On a gig, something will go wrong. Multiple things might go wrong. And if you haven't practiced the ability to think on your feet and the ability to react musically and quickly to something that's going sideways, you are not going to have those reflexes in you. You are not going to be gig ready. You are not going to be able to get out of a mistake without getting flustered and without stopping. Stopping on a gig is the cardinal sin. When music is transient in a live setting, the mistake is gone before most people have a chance to perceive it and realize it. So what's most important is not dwelling on the mistake, but getting out of it in a rapid and musical way. There will be things that go wrong on gigs that you could never possibly imagine, that you could never possibly replicate in a practice scenario. But what you can do is practice your response time, your reaction time. However much music you need to play in one shot, you need to practice playing that material consistently and continuously and getting out of anything that might throw you or derail you so that the show goes on. If you enjoy the content on this channel, if you want to see more content like this on the channel, click the like button, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already, leave a comment, let me know what element of this was most helpful for you, what you have found to be extremely helpful in your own practice time, especially over this past year. Let's get a conversation going. If you're feeling particularly generous and you want to support the channel, please go over to my Patreon page where I put up exclusive content, videos, PDFs that expand upon these ideas. Follow me on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, at Rishpan Music. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Happy practicing.